Welcome. Today, some of you might know this card. This is the 1050 that had issues with its DVI port that I repaired a little bit earlier. If you haven't seen the video, you might want to check it out. But today, this doesn't matter. The card works perfectly now and um, I want to upgrade it. Right now, it has 2GB of VRAM and my idea is to upgrade this to 4GB. So basically to the same amount of memory that a 1050 Ti has. Now if you remember the upgrade video on the RX 480 that I did some time ago, there um, the upgrade process is straightforward. You have to replace the chips and then basically that's it. You have to flash a new BIOS and the memory is detected by the card, no worries. Nvidia cards aren't that easy in a sense. You have to do what's called a strap mod. And a strap mod is basically some resistors that tell the card what memory and how much memory is mounted on the card and then it detects it via these resistors rather than the BIOS. And today I want to upgrade this. And to upgrade it, I will use the memory from this PlayStation 4 mainboard. This is a SAC001, so it's the 1200 series. So we're basically the second series of the PS4 FATS. And I'm going to use this memory here for uh, four modules. If you don't want to buy a PS4 for this project, which I can totally understand because it doesn't make any sense, if you don't already have it, you can buy these memories on the usual suspects such as AliExpress, eBay, and so on. And they will cost, say, 10, 15 US dollars a piece. So let's have a look, closer look at the 1050. Now, basically this mod is going to be one, we have to remove these memory chips, these four here. Then I remove the donor chips from the PS4 board. After that, I'm going to reball the PS4 chips and solder it back onto this uh, graphics card. After this is done, we have to change the straps to tell the card what memory is on. Now, but basically, these are straps and we will have to shuffle them around a little bit. And after that, it's done. So. Let's remove the chips from the PS4. I wiggle away the old solder and cleaned the chips a bit with alcohol to remove the flux residues and now they're ready to be reballed. For that I put a small solder ball, 0.45mm on each pad and make it ready to solder it to the graphics card. And to do that, first add a small amount of flux to each chip, so this the, the balls can stick a little bit better. and then put the stencil on. After that, I mount it into the reballing chip. So now it's ready to be reballed. I will add the solder balls, put one in each hole, and then melt them onto the chip. Let's remove the chips.
Now we have to remove the old soldier from the flux and blend. Let's put the memory back on. Now, I was a bit clumsy. Uh, with the last memory module, I also removed two capacitors and I remedied that back on. And now it's time to put the memory back on and then try the hook. I'm putting this memory back on. We need to be somewhat precise, but not super precise, since the chips will align themselves. What's important is that the white triangle here and the dots on the chip match up, because that's the orientation of the chip, but apart from that, it's okay this way. So I'll solder it back up. So now that we soldered the memory in place, uh, there is another step that we need to do for the car to work, and that is to the strap mod. Now straps are basically kind of switches or something, so they pull the a data line to a certain voltage. This voltage it might be that it's uh, pulled down to ground, it might be that it's uh, pulled up to 1.8 volt, or there is multi straps um, where you have like a voltage divider with a with a certain voltage. And these voltages are uh, the GPU has a lookup table where it looks up according to the voltage memory settings are being set. So say if you have we have three straps, so straps zero, one, and two. If all of them are low, that might mean four gigabyte Samsung memory. If strap 0 and 1 are low and 3 is high, that might mean it's micron 4 gigabyte memory and so on. And to find these values, it's not that easy, but it's not impossible. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed to show any board views or schematics because of the Swiss fair use law or citation law, but um, it's quite likely that you won't find the schematics and board view for your specific card. But the names for the resistors that we need to change are usually the same across all manufacturers. So Gigabyte, Asus, um, Pallet, whatever, they all use the same names for these kind of components. Different components might be named different, but like straps are usually the same on every, say, 1050 or every 1080 Ti. So that's working in favor of you. Another thing is, especially for the 1050, I couldn't find any schematics for graphics card. But what I did find was uh, schematics for laptops with a dedicated 1050 or 1050 mobile. And the straps on these schematics actually worked on this card as well. So if you can't find the schematic for your card or your type of card, 
then you it might be then useful to have a look at laptops. Also, it's okay. It's, um, the strap values are the same for all, or that's specific to the GPU, not the board. The most difficult part, if you don't have a, uh, a board view for your for your GPU, will be finding these straps on the board. Not all manufacturers um, label their components as nicely as Gigabyte or Asus do. Some of them label only a couple. Some of them don't label any components at all. And in those cases, it's yeah, you have to do a lot of searching. You can look up schematics from other cards and see where these uh, straps should be connected to, then uh, beep it out, but that's very, very tedious. In my case, I was lucky enough to find a board view that's very, very close to this card. Um, it's also from Gigabyte. It has a slightly different layout, but the straps are the same. They are in the same position and um, I verified that the ground and 1.8 volts are the same as well. So I was lucky with that. But if you are not so lucky and you want to do that, you have to do a lot of searching, look at a lot of board views and um, schematics, and you eventually you probably will be able to find them. There is no like easy answer to that except for search for. Anyways, in my case, I had to values I had to use. I found them on a Lenovo laptop with a dedicated 1050 and. In my case, it was um, low, low, high, so strap 0, low, strap 1, low, and strap 2 is high. And I did exactly that, and it did work out perfectly fine. I'm not too sure about the schematic that I used, if it was for the 1050 or 1050 mobile. In any case, it did work out, so apparently they are the same. This one here is strap 2, I think. And here we have strap, straps uh, 0 and 1, and also strap 3 that we won't use. And I had to change them from pull up to pull down. Here I had to do that from pull down to, to pull up, so I had to invert every um, strap basically. And yeah. After you've done that, um, you can fire up the card and see what it does, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. As you can see here, the card boots just fine. It gives a picture, it's being detected properly, so yeah, it works really good. Now, on the first try, I used the wrong straps, and you can see here from the GPU set readout, it was detected as Samsung memory. I changed that, or I rectified that, so it's uh, properly detected as micro memory, and after that, I did my usual testing routine, such as running a bit of Fairmark, um, doing some folding at home, and um, it passed everything without a hiccup. But let's have a look at the benchmark, since this card is in this configuration kind of unique. So yes, there are some 4GB 1050s, but they are from the mobile and not the regular desktop version. So it's quite interesting to have a look at the benchmarks. And it's the same as with 8GB uh, memory mod on the RX 480. The synthetic GPU benchmarks are kind of underwhelming. I did Firestrike Extreme, Superposition and Time Spy, and all of them are within the margin of error, so like plus minus 1%, and that's really... it's the same. But I was able to run more benchmarks. So with the 2 gigabyte version, I couldn't run Firestrike Ultra, for example, and now I can do that, since uh, Firestrike Ultra needs more than 2 gigabyte of memory. And on top of that, when we have a look at the games, then the picture is very different, because as you can see here, the Shadow of the Tomb Raider with a ultra preset 1090p, the performance improved from 14 frames per second and on average to 30, and the 95th percent I went up from 11 frames per second to 24. So in summary, this means this game on the ultra preset, okay, but this game went from absolutely unplayable to a, well, okay-ish performance. And that's quite a bit of a performance increase for the same card. So in conclusion, 
this is quite a big update for this card. Not every game will profit the same as uh, Tomb Raider did, but on average um, performance went up or stayed the same. This could also be observed on Witcher, there the performance pretty much stayed the same, which isn't that surprising since on the settings that I did run the game, or the card could run the game, it was only using one and a half gigabyte of V memory, so it is not constrained or not bottlenecked by um, the amount of memory that the card has available to it. But uh, what's very important to me is um, the card runs stable, it's passed every stability test that I did on it and um, it's perfectly usable, so that's quite uh, an improvement overall and I'm happy with that. I hope you enjoyed and see you next time.